Okay, so this is uh, kind of the beginning of the Cold War um, lecture. Um, obviously, I kind of introed it and kind of expressed, you know, kind of gave you some key terms and told you about the um, told you about the textbook. Um, if you know, if you're listening to this, I'm going to run through some of the major events. Now, this is going to be very relevant. Um, to what we're doing with NSC 68. Um, and it's very important that you understand NSC 68, mostly because um, mostly because it's going to be tied to the Eastfield Objective Essay. And this is really going to um, be li also linked to the Patriot Act. So it's going to kind of build on what we started talking about with Korematsu, um, which is that, you know, Sometimes when we're talking about national security, um, things like civil liberties kind of get pushed to the side. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we're going to go with this. But this is just going to be some of the background stuff. I'm going to try to go quickly. And I realize that's me talking. Um, so basically, let's see if I can get this thing to move on. There we go. Um, you want to be sure that you understand. And I've talked about some of this in relation to the end of World War II, which is going to be, um, which is going to be the uh, Yalta conference where you have kind of this promise to allow free elections. Uh, and remember the Atlantic Charter kind of said, we're going to have this democratic society. And so Yalta was supposed to promise that. Um, and very clearly he's not doing that. By the time you get to Potsdam, you have this emerging tension going on. Um, and so you're going to have, um, you know, the beginnings of the Cold War right there in Potsdam. And then, of course, in Germany, after World War II, um, you're going to have people trying to escape the communist areas. Of course, remember that Germans were very terrified of Soviet communists. Excuse me. And um, so that's going to be um, that kind of flow of people. is going to be a source of frustration uh, to the Soviet Union. Another term that you have to know is this concept of containment, and, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, the big concept I want you to know there is related to the Long Telegram in 1946. Um, this is four years before the NSC 68. Um, this is also before you have the, uh, you know, the Berlin blockade and uh, the emergence of Korea and some of that stuff. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit early in the Cold War, um, but I pointed out to you because I think to understand that we have a profound shift within NSC 68, um, you have to understand that the Long Telegram in 1946 was written by um, a diplomat by the name of George Keenan. And what he argues is that, yes, we have a tense relationship with the Soviet Union. No, we aren't really sure we can completely trust them. Uh, but the Soviet system is inherently weak. Um, and if we just kind of keep it in a box, you know, and kind of maybe don't give it as much food and water, so to speak, um, it would eventually collapse on itself. And we definitely see that this idea, we'll see it kind of alluded to um, in NSC 68. We'll certainly see that as we start talking about um, the Cold War and that kind of thing, especially when we get to Ronald Reagan, um, you'll see the impact of kind of this pressure on the Soviet system, that the Soviet system, system blah, 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 can't, can't handle a lot of external pressure. Um, and so I think that that's very important for you to understand. Now, what will happen by 1948 is that we kind of turn away from that um, and, you know, and focus a lot on kind of the military buildup aspect of it. Um, but I think it's important to realize that in 1946, it was identified that the system was likely to collapse on itself. And it does. Um, it just, you know, takes about 45 years. Um, so be sure you understand that term. Um, you have some other tensions that are emerging um, it, in Iran. You're going to have some tension there um, with the Soviets wanting access to Iranian oil. Um, this is going to be part of the backstory when we start thinking about um, the actions of the United States in Iran, CIA covert operations, kind of the orchestrated overthrow of a democratically elected leader in Iran. Um, this will kind of set up the Shah of Iran who, you know, will eventually be overthrown. And it's after that that you're going to have kind of this frustration with westernized powers that's going to lead to the Iranian hostage crisis, right? 
Um, and so this is kind of where that starts, actually. Um, you're going to have some pressure from uh, in Turkey and in Greece. And in fact, in fact, Turkey and Greece are going to lead to kind of this idea of the Truman Doctrine, um, because the Soviets are kind of putting pressure on there. They're trying to help communists and that kind of thing. Um, and so the U.S. is going to respond by having a battleship nearby and that kind of thing. Um you're going to see that the Truman Doctrine is specifically to any kind of aid, financial, military, you name it, to anybody who's trying to resist um, kind of this, this forced communism, that kind of thing. Um, ultimately, the Truman Doctrine is going to pledge the United States to kind of this long-term commitment. Um, the other concept that I think you need to be aware of is going to be the Marshall Plan. Um, the Marshall Plan is... A, but, kind of created by George Marshall. Um, and it's really the idea that it's a European recovery plan. And you might notice that in the NSC 68 document, um, that basically the United States is going to invest in Europe to help it rebuild, help it build roads and schools and all that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of the economic arm, if you will, of American investment and kind of this global concept. Um, so it's very important for you to kind of understand that, that you have the U.S. doing a lot of different things um, going into this process. Um, and you do, um, you know, this is all designed to kind of make communism see, seem less attractive um, by proposing this sort of um, higher standard of living or whatever that we see happening in the United States. Um, other things that we have going on, uh, Britain, France, and the U.S. merge their zones. I mentioned this the other day. Um, and when that happens, you're going to have the Soviets kind of isolating West Berlin, and you have the Berlin airlift. Um, so you want to be sure that you understand that you've got, and the Berlin airlift is really, I mean, it, when you think about Truman, even with Greece and Turkey. I mean, it's not like he's firing on people, right? What he's doing is kind of gently applying pressure, um, letting the Soviets know that the U.S. is not going to just disappear into the sunset. Um, remember the American tendency for isolation. And I think that Truman's handling of this um, is actually going to be very much um, kind of the right approach. He's not being overtly aggressive, but he's clearly not backing off. Um, which really takes us to the fact that Truman, I think, doesn't get um, kind of a fair fair assessment of his role as president. I think he actually does a much better job than we tend to give him credit for. Um, we'll see that the Western European countries, the ones like Britain and France and um, Italy and those kind of places, they will become a part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We still have NATO today. Um, NATO obviously operates not as an anti-communist group, but definitely as kind of a mutual defense alliance. Um, the Soviets will create the same thing with the Warsaw Pact. And this kind of shows you right here. The pink areas are going to be the Warsaw Pact areas. This kind of greenish area are going to be the uh, be the NATO areas. The ones that are in that kind of cream color, just they're not, they don't belong to either one. Um, and that red line right there is considered the, what, what Churchill pegged as the Iron Curtain, which is this idea that the Soviets have exerted their influence in all these little bitty countries. They've not allowed free free elections, and they forced kind of the Communist Party to be in power. So Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, East Germany, these are their own countries. They're not part of the Soviet Union, but their their Communist Party clearly takes its orders from the Soviet Union, and so that's why it's the Iron Curtain. That's why it's Eastern Europe and that kind of thing. Um, in Asia, um, you're going to see that Mao Zedong um, is going to successfully defeat the nationalists. Of course, the Communist Chinese Chinese um, Chairman Mao's forces are going to be very successful in fighting the Japanese. Um, and so you're going to have this tension with the nationalists going to Taiwan. And this is going to create kind of a crisis within the United Nations. And remember, the United Nations is brand new. Um, and on the Security Council, which are those five key seats, right, with the U.S., Britain, France, China, and Russia, 
or Soviet Union rather, um, you know, you're going to have the U.S. and Britain and France basically saying, well, the only Chinese government we recognize is the nationalist ones. And the communist Chinese are like, um, yeah, but we control all of China except for Taiwan. And the Soviet Union is going to get mad because the U.S. is refusing to recognize um, the communist Chinese. Um, and so the Soviets will kind of boycott the Security Council. And this is going to be very important into kind of the creation of the Korean War. Um, the Korean War is not a declared war by the U.S. Congress. Instead, it is a United Nations police action. And it's authorized by the Security Council. But that's a Security Council that has the Soviets boycotting it and has the nationalist Chinese occupying the Chinese seat. Um, so obviously... Um, that's going to be part of why we have Korea happening. Um, and the U.S. is going to invest very heavily in Japan and in democratic areas. Um, what will happen, Korea had typically been under the control of Japan. Um, so at the end of World War II, you basically have kind of the Soviets um, and the communist Chinese who are kind of, you know, occupying, milling about um, the northern part of Korea, and you've got American forces in the southern part of Korea. Um, and so, you, you know, the initial idea is, well, we'll just kind of, we'll kind of chill for a little bit, we'll make Korea independent, we'll let Korea decide if they want to be communist or not. Um, but before they have a chance to have that election, the northern Korea, North Koreans invade South Korea, with military assistance from China. Um, and that's going to kind of trigger this, this uh, you know, showdown between the United Nations led by the United States and Britain and France and that kind of thing, um, and North Korea and the Chinese. Now, it's important to understand that um, the Chinese uh, really don't like the Soviets that much. They don't want to become a satellite nation to the Soviet Union. Um, so they very much resist control by the Soviets. Um, the other thing that we see happening is that the Kim family, the Kim Jong-un that's in control, um, the grandson of the guy that was put in power by, by really the Chinese communists. Um, so they are kind of the ones um, that they take over. We eventually, um, at the end of the Korean War, kind of draw a line there. And that's why we have North Korea and South Korea. Um, so understand that when we talk about Korea being very backwards, um, it's backwards along the line of 1950 backwards, right, in a, in a 21st century world. Um, so you want to be sure you know about the Korean War. I don't think you would have a whole lot of... Uh, questions on the Korean conflict, which is a shame because it's, it's at, there's a lot of interesting stuff to be learned about it. Um, but for the star purposes and really even for a survey class purpose, um, I don't know that you need to know a whole lot um, other than what initially caused it, which is kind of this, you know, independence for Korea and the North Koreans invading and the United Nations coming in and pushing the North Koreans out and that you end up with kind of the stalemate, right? This armistice. Um, understand that this is part of what, um, part of what will happen um, with Truman, right? So Truman's going to win the 1948 election, barely, but he's going to do it. Um, and so he's the president when Korea falls apart. Now, um, one of the things that will happen is Douglas MacArthur is going to be put in charge of the Korean War for the United Nations. And he's going to be very critical of Truman because Truman will not allow uh, the use of atomic weapons. And MacArthur's answer is, well, let's just drop a bomb. Right. But Truman isn't OK with that. Right. I mean, his decision to use atomic weapons in J Japan was very specific to what was going on at the end of World War II. Um, and with Japan in particular. And so basically Truman says no. Um, MacArthur is very critical in the press. MacArthur gets fired by Truman. Um, and so you're going to basically going to see that the Korean conflict, on top of being this UN battle, you're going to have kind of this power struggle with MacArthur and Truman. Um, and really, it's it's a it's a war of really cold winters, um, lots of small battles. It's kind of this, you know, there's not this real sense of we have a clear objective and a clear victory. In fact, it ends up with kind of the stalemate. And uh, Eisenhower will win the 1952 election. Um, and when he does, one of the first things he'll do when he becomes president is sign an armistice um, and, and really basically get the troops out of there. Um, and so this is why we have that, that what is that, the uh, 59th parallel, I believe it is, 39th parallel, something like that. Um, and so you definitely see that this is kind of the background um, for the Korean conflict. 
um, the results of the Korean War, you're going to have this idea of an increased military buildup, um, that we don't want to just rest on kind of that soft pressure that we saw with the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine, that we want to focus primarily on kind of having that strong military to back up that soft pressure. Um, and this constant preparation for war, this is where the NSC 68 will come in, that's written in 1950. Um, and you're also going to see that the U.S. is kind of much more attentive to what's going on in Asia. Um, so we're not going to just kind of shrug our shoulders and pretend that Asia is, you know, not really important like we did going into World War II. Instead, we're going to focus very heavily on what's happening in Asia um, and pay close attention to that. Um, and you're going to see very early, I mean, in the 1950s, we're starting to send advisors and that kind of thing into um, what becomes Vietnam, which back then it was known as French Indochina. Um We'll go into a little more detail on the history of Vietnam um, after World War II. Um, when we get to that part, that'll be the end of the Cold War um, that we're talking about. Um, Eisenhower's policies, this is Eisenhower specifically related to um, the Cold War. So this part is really just about the Cold War. Um, and what we're going to see is that you have um, a great deal of frustration with Harry Truman and the Cold War and kind of his handling of the Korean conflict. And again, remember, Americans are tired of fighting. They want to just go home. They want to watch TV. They want to have babies and that kind of thing. Um, and so they're basically going to turn to... Um, People are going to turn to Eisenhower, you know, with his you know, military background and leading kind of the European theater and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it, literally his slogan is going to be, I like Ike, right? Um, and so he does allow for kind of this NSC 68 approach with a strong military. Um, but he also embraces atomic weapons and allows for a lot more atomic buildup, which, as you'll see, is part of the NSC 68. But I think it's also because Eisenhower had sent young men to die. Right. He had been that he'd been a general that had had to do that. And I think he appreciated um, kind of this idea that um, that atomic weapons could help save lives. Um, and this is particularly true through things like brinksmanship and mutually assured destruction. Um, that if we have nuclear weapons, don't make us use them. Because if we do, um, it's going to get really bad really fast. And so Eisenhower was always ready to, much more so than Truman, to kind of put his toe on the line and say, um, yeah, no farther, right? Um, and so I think that this is one of the reasons why the Korean War is able to come to a conclusion with the armistice. Because I think he basically tells China, look, we're going to back off. We're going to stop this. We're going to draw this line. And what this means is that, you know, and if you don't want to, then we're going to drop an atomic bomb. So you kind of have that threat with kind of the shifting um, with the new president and that kind of thing. Um, the next big thing you need to be sure you know is the impact of Sputnik, right? Um, and of course, you have other things like B-52s, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, nuclear submarines, that kind of thing. But when we have the launch of Sputnik, which really is just kind of this blinking radio transmitter, right? There's nothing big about it, um, but it terrifies the United States because we know we have these nuclear weapons. We know that the Soviet Union has nuclear weapons, but now there's this blinking light bulb up in space. And what might happen? What might the Soviets be capable of? And as you read NSC 68, you'll notice kind of that level of anxiety about what are the Soviets' real capabilities? What do we think they can do? And so Sputnik is going to terrify everybody, and it's going to cause a real um, kind of liberal reaction in the sense that you're going to have major spending for education with the NDEA, National Defense of Education Act. You're going to have the creation of NASA, um, to basically research and kind of get us involved in the space race. So it's 1957-58, which is the beginning of the space race. So it's very important that you be familiar with that. Um, of course, here's a picture of Sputnik right there. Um, the next thing, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, because Eisenhower is very reluctant to use actual soldiers, you're going to see him kind of embracing the use of covert operations. Um, this is really the golden age of the CIA. Um, and the CIA is very busy trying to prevent communist action, right? Trying to 
to knock off communist regimes before they rise to power. Um, and of course, this is going to be a real issue when you start looking at the impact of third world, third world, although that's, I guess, not the PC term anymore, undeveloped countries, um, you know, places in, in Central America, South America, Africa. Um, and, you know, they're looking for rapid industrialization, rapid way to catch up. Well, communism makes that very easy because you don't have all this arguing back and forth, right? Um, and so you're going to see in Iran, and I kind of mentioned that, where you have that coup to overthrow the Iranian president, um, and that's going to really bite us in the tail um, when we get to the 1970s. Uh, same thing in Guatemala, Hungary, that kind of thing. And the end result of these covert operations is you're going to have an increasingly tense relationship with the Soviets. Um, Stalin will die in 1954 and he'll be replaced by Nikita Khrushchev. Um, and Khrushchev is going to be upset by kind of the American covert operations and how they're kind of you know, meddling in these other countries, um, trying to thwart communism. And of course, you know, for the Soviets, that means that they're kind of removing potential allies for them. Um, but you're also going to see that in 1958, um, the Soviets will say, you know, we want Western forces out of uh, West Germany. We want uh, atomic weapons out, all that kind of stuff. And basically the United States says, you know what, you know, don't do that. Don't go there. We're not going to remove our troops. Um, 1960, we'll sh the Soviets will shoot down a U-2 spy plane that'll make the U.S. very embarrassed. The U.S. will try to say, oh, it's a weather craft. It's a weather craft. It's not a spy plane. But then they basically like take pictures of the pilot and the inside of the plane. And it's kind of like, oops, um, guess it was. Um, so you definitely have this increasing tension with the Soviet Union. Um the, the one of the most famous things too is going to be the military industrial complex speech um, when Eisenhower's getting ready to leave in 1961. So he's the president from 53 through 61 um, for the majority of the 1950s. He's kind of like the face that we identify with uh, the 1950s. He's going to caution the American public about creating this military complex that constantly needs war to feed itself, to justify its existence, as well as the drain on the economy. And I think it's very important that you understand this idea that that military spending for all that, it does stimulate economic growth. That long sustained military spending can eventually create kind of a hangover, if you will, um, that it's kind of like overindulging. Um, it's, you know, eating too many sweets and not enough good food um, because this is a kind of spending that's very consumable. Um, you know, you don't make military things, military weapons or whatever um, to invest in your country. You make it to be used. And so if you make all this stuff to be used and you never use it, that's a real problem. Um, in addition, are we really investing in our people? Are we investing in our society? Um, so this is where the military industrial complex speech becomes very important. Um, and again, these lasting tensions are very important as far as kind of setting us up for the Cold War as it goes into the 1960s. Um, the next thing about the 1950s that I want to be sure you're aware of is going to be this idea of economic growth. Um, first off, you have the end of World War II, you have the end of rationing. Um, and the end of rationing is going to, you know, you're going to have people that have been saving up their money, not able to buy what they wanted to buy. And now all of a sudden, you know, they have extra money and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so they're going to have plenty of money uh, to spend. You're going to have husbands coming home. Um, women, of course, leave the workforce to make room for their husbands. Everybody's excited the war's over. So there's, you know, lots of babies being born. This is where the baby boom comes in. Um, and of course, some of this too is that the depression had made people put off having children. So now in the prosperity that seems to be because you'd had you know, four years of, you know, almost full employment and almost nothing to buy thanks to rationing. We have plenty of money to spend. And so people are really, you know, ready to get back to the business of living. Um, one of the things, one of the, the things that, that we learned with World War II that we didn't, that we didn't realize in World War I is when a war's over, you don't just want to throw the veterans back into the workforce, that that will shock the system too quickly. And so you need to be sure that you know the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, also known as the GI Bill. 
Um, the GI Bill, we still have it today. So this is one when guys who go into the military and then get their college paid for, this is part of how they do that. Um, and it really kind of, it, it helps the transition of soldiers back into private life, gives them, uh, you know, basically free education. If they want to go to college, it gives them, um, very low interest loans to start a business or to buy a home um, and that kind of thing. And so it really kind of expands the role of the government in taking care of its veterans. And it's very unique. Um, and it really does a lot to kind of create the prosperity of the 1950s because you have kind of this, this investment in people, essentially. Um, and so I think it's very important that you understand that that happens. Um, and this is going to lead to this increased educational level. Um, that's going to lead to increased money, increased suburbs. We're going to have... Um, that middle class life, kind of this idea of the American dream um, is going to happen. And because we have more people, more families, more babies, we have more suburbs, more money to spend. We have more production, which is going to lead to more jobs. So you have this overall massive growth of the economy and of society, really, in a lot of ways. Um, so you need to be sure that you understand that trend after World War II, as well as the pressure that it's going to put on society and on living space. Like right after World War II, we have a major housing crisis. Yeah. This is going to lead to the creation of suburbs, um, places like Levitt Town and that kind of thing, the cookie cutter houses. Um, and you're going to have this expansion of what we call urban sprawl, where cities just start to get bigger. And of course, we're so accustomed to metroplexes now, we don't necessarily think about that. Um, but that was a big deal. And so you've got issues about green space and like, where are we going to, you know, how does this impact wildlife? And these are all things that come out of the rapid growth of the 1950s and the expansion of the suburbs and kind of this idea of higher, of increased traffic and all that sort of thing. Um, and of course you have, you know, all increased leisure time. So this is where television is going to come in um, and, and the family vacation and all that kind of stuff is going to come out of the 1950s. So there's a lot about our society in 2016 that we think of as being very American that are really specifically defined for the 1950s. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting contrast. It's very easy for us to think, oh, well, it's always been, we've always had the vacation. We've always had the suburbs. We've always had, you know, the white picket fence and all that kind of stuff. The reality is that is not um, until after World War II as well as the massive consumption of, you know, convenience things like refrigerators and air conditionings and vacuum cleaners and ironing boards and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you've got that happening, um, mass produced clothing, department stores, all that kind of stuff. And it's all because of the disposable income. Um, it's also going to lead to very clearly defined gender roles um, because you have this idea of women being put back into the home and try to communicate to women that, you know, hey, it's this is where you need to be. And so our gender roles get really very fixed, which is unusual when you consider the 1920s and even the 30s and even the 40s with women gaining this new independence in the 20s. Um, with women struggling just right along with men and in the 1940s with Rosie the Riveter. But now we see these fixed gender roles kind of putting people, you know, back in these very rigid, you know, roles to play. Um, and this is, there's going to be a real reaction against this in the 1960s. Now, obviously in the fifties, they're not focusing on that. Um, another aspect of the increased production is going to be technological improvements, kind of the earliest steps towards computers. Of course, the computers in the fifties are the massive mainframes. Um, but you're also going to see a lot more money for research and development. And a lot of it has to do with NASA and science and technology because of Sputnik and the atomic race and all that kind of stuff. But you're also going to see agriculture and that sort of thing to feed all these people. And don't forget the medicine, right? We've had a bunch of babies. You've got this concern about health care. And as you look at NSC 68, you'll see that one of the major things about American society is our standard of living, that our standard of living is really great and that we need to maintain that. And so part of that's going to be medical care. And the polio vaccine is a big part of that. So you need to be sure you identify the polio vaccine and Jonas Salk with the 19, 1950s rather. Um, and of course, you know, polio was the disease that had affected FDR, you know, affected a lot of kids, um, you know, to varying degrees. And so the idea that we would start to develop vaccines and we would have baby formula and all this kind of stuff. Um, this is why you have so many, 
um, so many like magazines and stories and stuff that are meant to kind of talk about women and families and, and taking care of children and all that kind of stuff and school systems and all that. Um, domestically in the 1950s. Um, we're going to kind of rewind a little bit and go back to Truman. Um, be sure that because we're concerned about this idea of unemployment and recession, we don't want to go back to 1938, right, which was a recession in the middle of a depression. Um, so this is where the GI Bill is going to come about because of Truman's term. Um, of course, he'll, he'll take over for FDR in 1945. Um, he will win the election in his own right in 1948. Um, and so you'll see kind of that will happen. Um, so really kind of this is in the tail end of what was actually FDR's term. Um, and you're going to see that you have, you know, that really kind of work to handle labor strikes, handle inflation, because now people have money. So there's a huge demand for products. And so, you know, it, it's not a piece of cake just because the war's over. But Truman and, um, and the Republican Congress are going to do pretty well handling all of that. Um, Truman will come in and he'll basically have his own version of a new deal. Um, one of the things he will talk about is expanded Social Security payments, uh, minimum wage, all that kind of stuff, public housing, um, national health insurance, right? We tend to think that national health insurance didn't come about until Obama became president, but that's not true at all. We've been talking about a national health insurance plan since the 1940s. Um, so you definitely see that Truman's going to kind of propose that. Um, he's also going to ask for a civil rights bill. Uh, remember that the military forces were integrated in 40, or military bases rather, were integrated in 43. The full um, military service, like every branch of the military is integrated in 1948. And you can thank Truman for kind of that first major step towards civil rights. And of course, this is tied directly to minority participation in World War II. Um, and so you definitely see him, you can see the list right there, really, really wants to take this very progressive leap forward. Um, he immediately starts facing a lot of criticism, though. Um, Republicans that are afraid of a return to big, um, big government, especially after FDR and the New Deal, and then the World War II stuff. Um, they want to push back. And Southern Democrats who are upset about uh, the civil rights stuff, who are upset about the integration of the military forces. So we have that nasty little side of American society raising its head um, in 1948. And that's going to lead us to kind of this, this beginning of the shift of the Southern states towards the Republicans. Now, they're not really shifting yet. That's not going to happen until Nixon becomes president. But you do see that Southern Democrats start calling themselves Dixiecrats, right? Which means we're technically, we're Democrats, um, but we don't agree with civil rights legislation. And we, we're uncomfortable with too much federal government. And so you start to see kind of this in-between phase of the Southern Democrats. Um, and then you're going to have some people that are frustrated by Truman's anti-communism because one of the things that's happened happening uh, with Truman and, you know, going from 1948 into the early 1950s are, is the Red Scare, McCarthyism, uh, loyalty oaths for teachers and government employees. Um, so there's this real concern about the impact of communism and espionage and all that kind of thing, a real Red Scare. Um, and so what's going to happen is that liberal people, very progressive people, are going to be upset about um, the blacklist and all that kind of stuff. And so they're going to push back against Truman. And, of course, the irony is Truman is actually very progressive. Um, but, you know, he had this real concern about the strength of the Soviet Union. And when you look at the NSC 68, this will make sense. Um, and Truman points the finger at Republicans and he says, well, it's because the Republicans are being obstructionist. Um, in reality, it's that the Democratic Party was starting to fall apart. Um, and, you know, and so what's going to happen is you have a very close election in 1948. Uh, in fact, I think CNN just did a uh, race to the White House special over Truman and Dewey. Um, and so what's going to happen is that Truman will manage to win in 1948. Um, Democrats will win control of the Congress. Um, and you will see some of Truman's uh, kind of fair deal um, get pushed through Congress, but not all aspects of it, but some aspects of it. So you want to be sure you know kind of that emerging tension with U.S. politics. And of course, this is a famous picture because the Chicago Tribune thought Dewey was going to win. And so they published the printed the paper. And then when the results finally came in, 
um, Truman actually had the electoral votes. Um, so, but by the time you get to say 1950 with the Korean conflict, you have the whole um, brouhaha with MacArthur. Um, and so that's going to tend, you know, and then you also have the impact of McCarthyism and the Red Scare um, and this targeting of artists and this targeting of people and, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's really going to hurt Truman's reputation. So when he wants to run again in 1952, Eisenhower, you know, really can easily beat him because uh, Truman has really disappointed a lot of people. So I really think that if we're thinking about Truman, his, his, you know, first term, if you will, um, those years from 45 through 48 um, are really the high point um, for Truman. After you get, you know, into 1949, things start to kind of go bad. Um, and you start to see, not bad in the sense that Truman's a bad guy, but bad in the sense that the pressures of fighting communism and the fear of the Soviets um, in conjunction with, um, you know, the Red Scare and all that kind of stuff are really going to hurt his reputation. Um, so Eisenhower will win in 52 very easily. His vice president will be Richard Nixon. Um, Richard Nixon uh, is, they don't really like each other. Um, and you actually, I put on here the checker speech. That's kind of the first sign that maybe Nixon's not completely honest. Um, he takes some campaign donations and uses them for his own benefit um, and kind of comes under fire for that. Eisenhower will win very easily. And really, Eisenhower, while he's a Republican, and he certainly begins to take down some of the big government kind of ideas that we saw from the New Deal, um, he does start to kind of, he doesn't totally abandon uh, progressive reforms, right? So he, he kind of shaves off some of these programs that had gotten too big um, and kind of scales down the size of government. But he also continues, you know, major investment in American society with Social Security and unemployment compensation, compensation. And most importantly, and the big one that you have to keep in mind is the 1956 Federal Highway Act that creates the interstate highway system. And of course, part of how Eisenhower is able to sell that to, to a Republican Congress in, you know, in 56 is going to be that, um, you know, it's a defense measure, right? That if we were to be attacked by the Soviet Union, we needed to be able to move troops and equipment and supplies and evacuate people. So we need better roads. Um, you know, also it's going to stimulate automobile production. And so you definitely have this kind of, you know, correlation between American prosperity and jobs and people having money to spend, the development of the automobile and people producing a lot of cars and buying a lot of cars, the growth of suburbs and traffic issues to, you know, this fear about the Red Scare and the Soviets. And so let's find a way to create a, a, a good transportation system. And if you think back to the late 1800s, I mean, that's one of the things that drives the massive economic growth um, going into the industrial, you know, into the Gilded Age and that kind of thing, um, which is railroad system, right? And the canals and all that kind of stuff. So you definitely see the same thing happening in the 1950s. And I think we could really learn a lesson from that as far as how to stimulate economic growth. Investing in transportation systems is always a good investment, um, even if you're going to go into debt for it. Um, and so I definitely think that you can kind of see um, the profound impact. If you're a big fan of the movie Cars, um, you're probably kind of familiar with this notion of closing down the old, uh, you, know, inter, you know, state highways and embracing these new interstates and that kind of thing. Um, and the impact of that. Um, so that's kind of a quick run through uh, on some of the domestic issues with Truman and Eisenhower. Again, this is a quick overview, quick drive by. I think I managed to do this in around 30 to 40 minutes, which is pretty good for me. Um, so this takes us through the 1950s and the key Cold War aspects as well as key domestic issues. Um, and so I'm going to stop it here. And then when I pick up with the next section, we'll be talking about the 1960s and looking at John F. Kennedy and LBJ. Um, and then probably also Vietnam, which will actually bridge a little bit into Richard Nixon. Um, all right.